Good evening, everybody. It is so awesome to be back here at the Torch Center. Um, we've, we had a few weeks of a break because of the high holidays and because of Sukkot and Simchat Torah. And now finally to be back here in like real flesh and blood to, you know, to see everybody here is really, really phenomenal. And it's very, very exciting. What we're going to talk about the, the next couple of weeks is um, probably the most important uh, discussion we've ever had in the Musser uh, Monday series. Um, and I think we've done close to 60 classes already um, on Musser Mondays. And I think it's just, it, it's so important that we really understand this fundamental principle in Judaism and that is the saying of the Shema the recitation of the Shema the meaning behind the Shema the intention and the focus when we recite the words of the Shema so let's dive right in I think it's important to just give a, pre a, 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 a preface I'm going to read you a story about Reblazer Silver. Anybody familiar with Reblazer Silver? He was a great rabbi. And in 1945, he was sent to Europe to help reclaim some of the Jewish children who were hidden during the Holocaust with non-Jewish families. And he was able to reach these children by going in to convince the monasteries and the churches to allow them to have access to the children. And he did one thing. During bedtime, he would walk around and he would say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Shema Yisrael. And the kids would be able to say it along with him. He knew they were Jewish children and he would take them out of there. This verse of Shema has forever been the most important verse in all of Judaism the most important verse this is our mission statement this is this is our uh, our national anthem this is the declaration of our uh, our 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 people this is who we are when rabbi akiva was being murdered and his body was being mutilated the words on his lips were Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad and when the millions of Jews were taken to the gas chambers and were murdered in all these horrible, horrible murderous animalistic ways what was the last words they recited? Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad so we have to understand what are these words and why do they encapsulate the entire relationship the Jewish people have with God. Everything is embedded in this. So before we get into the, the words and the details of the Shema, I think it's also important for us to just give the framework of why, why and when we say these words <coughs> and when this prayer is recited. So we have like this. The first... <coughs> There are four opinions. <coughs> you want a drink of water? No, I okay. have some. There are four opinions as to what the obligation of Shema is in the morning and evening. We know already from the verses of Shema that we have to recite it every morning <coughs> and every evening. <coughs> the question is, what needs to be recited every morning and every e evening? So, get ready, four opinions, very easy. One says only the first verse, one says the first verse and the first paragraph, one says the first verse, first paragraph, and second paragraph, and one says first verse, second pa first paragraph, second paragraph, and third paragraph. Very simple. So, which do we, which do we try to fulfill? So we try to fulfill all four, to recite the full Shema. But at the very least, if someone is unable to, for whatever reason, for, for medical reasons, if someone can't, if someone is unhealthy, if someone can't because they don't know it, 
So at least the first verse. The first verse, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Olokino, the reason I'm saying Hashem and not Hashem's full Ado and after that Nai is because first is this is going on to the onto the earwaves. And um, I, 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 I don't think it would be the proper display of Hashem's name um, on broadcast. But um, when we're not saying it for the purpose of uh, reading the verse or reciting it in part of our prayers, uh, so then we're supposed to use the name of Hashem, especially we're going to be talking a lot of each individual word in the Shema. So that's the reason I'm just giving that as an advance, so you know when I say the word Hashem, I mean Ado and Nai after that, right? As one word. Um, and Elokeinu, where I'm replacing the He with a K, so that it's not actually saying God's name. Okay. No. Yes. When you say Modiani Lefanecha first. Modiani Lefanecha is when we wake up. Yeah. When we wake up. Well, see, I, but this, I always say Shema right after that. That's fine. And, and you can, look, there's no limit to how many times a person can say the Shema. You can say the Shema a hundred times a day. That's fine. But there's a minimum of twice. Yeah. Every morning and every evening. Every evening. Where do we learn this from? From the actual verse of Shema, where it says that you should say it, uh, 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 when you say it, when you lay down lay and when down, you, when you arise. arise. Right? So when you wake up in the morning, say this, recite the Shema. When exactly? So during the first three hours of the, of the day. That's when people arise. That's when people get up. That's the right, the proper time to recite the Shema. There are people who are uh, holy and pious people. They wake up early, just at, at sunrise, and recite the Shema then so that they start their day with that declaration. So what is what are these verses? What are these verses? So there's a concept we need to talk about and explain, and it can take us a month to talk about this. I'll try to make it as brief as possible and as simple so that we can understand it. It's three words in Hebrew. Kabbalat ol malchut shamayim. Sorry, four words. Kabbalat ol malchut shamayim accepting upon ourselves the yoke, the burden of God. What does that mean? That means putting ourselves into the proper frame of mind where we recognize that we are creations of the Almighty, we are servants of God, we are here to fulfill a specific task that means this is the realignment of everything, getting right back in order. You know, during the day we get distracted with this and with that, and with that, all these different things. And now it's time to realign it. Twice a day, get back in the zone. Focus. Uh, today there's a very popular movement called um, um, a meditation, or the, right, they, 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 they do med a lot of meditation, or they do, um, it's called... Um, um, I don't remember. I don't remember. There's ex there's a name for it, but it's it's like um, feeling uh, feeling. Uh, connecting with your feelings, connecting with your emotions. I don't know what it's called. There's, there's a name. Someone's gonna hopefully someone will write it here on the, on the comments. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what this what this. But but there is this this getting centered, getting realigned. See, the whole world we're living in right now is a world of distractions, right? Whether it be politics, whether it be sports, whether it be uh, uh, um, hobbies, whether it be vacations, whether it be any materialism, all of these things are distractions. How easy is it for one to... Mindfulness, thank you, Marissa. Right? There's this whole world of mindfulness, right? It's getting into the, to the frame of mind... Getting into the frame of mind of why am I really here? What's the real purpose? And that is something that is, is incredibly important for us to have that mindfulness. We stop everything. We stop all of the distractions. We stop all of the, uh, all of the um, you know, desires and temptations. And, and we're, we're getting carried away with so many things around us. When do we get back in the zone? 
Anybody ever have a moment of inspiration where you're just inspired? You're like, you know what? I'm going to stop doing that terrible thing. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm just going to focus on being a good person. Right? How long does that last? Well, hopefully it lasts a lifetime. Hopefully, but it doesn't. We all know it doesn't. You go to a really inspirational speech, you go to a lecture, you go to a, to, you go to a sermon, you come to a torch class, you get so inspired, you say, that's it, I'm changing. And how long does that last? In a good case, 20 minutes. And we get into the car, we're like, you know, I should really change, and I turn on the radio, and you're like, Astros, that's right, when I get home, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta watch the, the replays of you know, the victory today, 11-2, it's pretty good. Congratulations. So we have all of these distractions. What gets us back aligned? Shema. In fact, the Talmud that we just learned in our Talmud lunch learn at 12 o'clock every Friday afternoon, we just learned what do you do if your Yetzirah, if your evil inclination attacks you? He tells you, go someplace where you know you shouldn't go. Watch something you know you shouldn't watch. Talk, say something you really shouldn't say. So what is, what is, the, the, what is the, um, the, uh, the, the Talmud? Can you pass me the Talmud Brachot right there? The first one. Right? I'll read it from inside. <coughs> right? <coughs> right there, the first one hiding. There you go, perfect. Thank you so much. So the Talmud says uh, on 23a, It says the following. Oh no no no! It's a different. It's a different. It, we learned it a few days ago. Sorry, it is not. Yeah, we did it. We did do it in our Talmud lunch learn, but we did it right before the high holidays. We learned something something different. So we were right over. So the Talmud says, what should you do if you have these temptations come and attack you? It says as follows. Okay, so he says, try to put your Yetzer Tov on top of your Yetzer Hara. Try to get your Yetzer Tov, your good, your good urges, your good desires, to battle with your negative ones. If he wins, great. If not, what do you do? Start learning Torah. If you learn Torah and you're still not able to overcome that evil desire, that, 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 that negative thought, start reading the Shema. And if that still doesn't work, remember your day of death. So we see that right beneath the fear of death is the power of Shema. Saying the Shema. It, it should put a shudder in our spine. The fear that's in, in tractate Brachot, uh, folio 5a, on the top. It's, it's, we, we all are, we're human. We're human. We have ups and downs. It's normal. But we need to realize that there are tools that God embedded into our world that can assist us in maintaining our status of growth, to maintain our loftiness, our inspiration. That's the Shema. The Shema realigns us. It puts everything back in order. You know, we've spoken numerous times in different settings about uh, stress. Why do people have stress? The more you have Hashem, the less stress you have. It's guaranteed. It's tried and true. Right? The more you have Hashem in your life, the less stress you will have, the less anxiety you'll have. So how do I do that? Well, 
here we have the opportunity in the, in the recitation of the Shema, we have the opportunity to get that godliness into our, into our consciousness. <coughs> and being fully mindful, to be fully mindful of God's presence right here. Now, there's another, another whole different aspect that we're going to see over the coming weeks. But I want to start with so, something very interesting. We know that the, our sages tell us that we have 365 days in the year. We also have 365 prohibitive commandments. And we also have 365 sinews in our body. And each one of the negative commandments corresponds to one of those. And how many bones do we have in our body? 248. And how many verses do we have in the Shema? So not verses. How many words do we have in the Shema? 248. Each verse in the Shema is corresponding to one of the positive commandments. 248 as well. To your limbs. 248. Each verse of the Shema. If you ever wondered, the beginning of the Shema, we say three words. Kel, Melech, Ne'eman. And it says, say that if you're praying alone. If you're praying at home alone, you say, Kel, Melech, Ne'eman. Translation, exact translation is, God, trustworthy king. And then we recite the Shema. But if you're saying it, in, and that would make it 248. If you didn't say it, it would be 245. So how do you get it to 248? Those are the last three words that are recited by the Chazan. Where the Chazan re repeats, Hashem Elokechem Emet. Hashem, your God, is true. That's at the end of the, when, that's when you pray in a minion. So when you pray in a minion, the last three are taken care of by the Chazan. And when you're not praying with the minion, you should say the Kel Melech Ne'eman at the beginning. So that you have your 248 words. There's, there, there's still a lot that we need to get to. So first, you know, we talk about bringing God into our consciousness. So we know that when we recite the Shema, one of the things we're supposed to do is cover our eyes we cover our eyes. We take our right hand and we cover our eyes. And we recite the Shema Yisrael. Those six words. And the obvious question is, why do we cover our eyes? Would it be enough, perhaps, to just close our eyes? Kavanah. Well, you can have Kavanah. Right? Kavanah is like the proper intention, the proper focus, with your eyes closed like this. Why do we need to cover our eyes? So I'll explain why the cover in a second, but let's first talk about why we cover, why we, why we have our eyes closed. What, what, what are we trying to not see? The right, So very good. So the the Chatam Sofer, when he talks about the menorah that was lit in the temple, he gives an incredible revelation. He says that we have physical eyes. We see things. Right now, I look, I see this marker. I see it right here. It's in front of me. And you see many things going on around you. You see the beautiful people here. You see furniture. You see cars outside. You see things. You see books here on the bookshelf in the magnificent uh, Don Levitt Family Library here at the Torch Center. Right? You just see incredible things. These things are distractions. Tam Sofer tells us, we also have a set of spiritual eyes. We have spiritual eyes in our mind. The only way to activate our spiritual eyes is to cover our physical eyes. You should try it once, even not for prayer. Just try to imagine something. Just try to think about something without the distractions around you. Close your eyes or put one of those uh, sleeping uh, uh, masks 
right, from the airplane. Right? Put that on top of your... And just think. Immerse yourself in thought. Right? Yes, people can call it a form of meditation. That's not the goal. The goal is to remove all the distractions because imagine if you're sitting right here, we're thinking about God sitting on His throne right now. Okay, everybody focus. Okay, let's, let's do an exercise. We're going to sit right now. And no, no, don't close your eyes. Uh-uh, right? We're going to try to do it without closing our eyes. It's going to be virtually impossible. You know why? Because I see, oh, he's got nice shoes, right? right? And so suddenly you start thinking about other things. You just feel like, oh, let me see. Um, I think we can use better lighting here, right? Just suddenly so many, so many things come to us. I actually think the lighting is great. Lighting is great. But um, we have many distractions that come our way when we, our eyes are busy. But try to close your eyes for a second and think about a boat on the ocean, a beautiful boat with a big sail, right? Everyone's there, right? Everyone sees that blue boat, right? It's much easier to imagine something. You can open your eyes, right? It's much easier to imagine something when your eyes are closed because you don't have those distractions. For this reason, our sages tell us, close your eyes when you recite the Shema. So that way, it's easier for you to get into the frame of mind of Hashem's presence. What does it mean that we're declaring Hashem is our God? We spent about 15 or 16 weeks discussing the principles of faith by Maimonides, the 13 principles of faith, and we'll see they'll, they'll come into play tremendously here in the Shema. Because if you don't believe in Hashem, it's hard to say Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem is our God. Hashem Echad, Hashem is one. So it, it, it's very important. This is a way for us to bring them all together. All of these principles, to bring in this fundamental prayer of Shema, and the mindfulness, the bringing in the presence of the Almighty into our consciousness. It's a very empowering thing for someone to just stop everything. The world stops. Stops moving. It stops spinning. And now we can just focus on Hashem is our God. He's right here. I'll, I'll tell you a very interesting story. My grandfather, you know, we have three prayers every day, morning, afternoon, and evening. And uh, morning services, yes, we go to synagogue and we pray in, in synagogue in the morning. And what's about the afternoon and evening? So many synagogues have, in, have a, a, um, a, a very easy, simple solution because if you're gonna, to get people to come back to synagogue three times a day could be taxing for people. People go to work. They're very busy. It's understandable. So what they do is you have to pray mincha during the daytime till before sunset, and you can begin reciting the evening service of Arvit or Ma'ariv right after sunset. It's not ideal, but let's say right after sunset. So what they do is they pray the mincha service 15 minutes before sunset. They start the evening service right after sunset. And boom, we got what we call BOGO. Buy one, get one. Right? You come to synagogue, you get the mincha, and you get the marav service, the afternoon and the evening service, and you get them both as one. And my grandfather never liked to do that. My grandfather... As the, the earliest time for you to recite the afternoon prayer would be immediately past the half point of the day, half day. So if the if the half point is let's say twelve thirty, so after one o'clock you can already pray. All right, so after one o'clock you can pray. It's the earliest time you can pray the afternoon prayer. The morning prayer is the first four hours, with the Shema being three, like we mentioned earlier. The afternoon prayers from the afternoon till sunset. The evening prayer from sunset to midnight. Midnight's not necessarily uh, 12 o'clock uh, a.m. Midnight is whatever, whatever midday is, it's the exact time at night. So if it's 1 o'clock, it would be 1 o'clock as well. At mid, right? A halachic midnight. So my grandfather would always go to the early, it's called minchag dola, he would go to the early mincha. And we asked him, why not? Why don't you just, you know, he was an older man already. And it was, it was a trek to, for him to go from his house to go to, to go to the synagogue to pray the mincha. 
You save one way, save two ways, right? Instead of going, right? Save one round trip. And then you just go for the Mincha Marav at the end. You know what he would say? He would say, I can't wait that long to talk to God. I can't. Uh, I'm in the middle of a conversation here. I, I can't just like, oh, to push it off to later. And then he was like, no, I can't wait that long. From all the way from the morning could be 6 a.m., 7 a.m., all the way till 7 o'clock at night. That, that's a long time not to speak to God. But that's something envious because I don't know about you, but I don't feel that like, you know, God is sitting there waiting for, to jot down my prayers, right? Mm -hmm. Right? But he really felt that. Now, we should all feel that. Just why we're talking about this to inspire myself and hopefully you in the process. But it's really for me, right? I'm selfish here, I'm sorry, right? But uh, the, the, the real goal here is to get ourselves to realize that this is a real relationship with God that we're trying to pursue through the Shema is to recognize Hashem is the king of the universe. Hashem is the king of all kings. Hashem is one. Hashem is one and only one. We have all of the Ten Commandments. I'm going to give out next week, God willing, I'm going to give out an actual uh, printout of the three chapters, of the, the three paragraphs of the Shema, including the first verse, with the translation. And um, I just put this together today. I don't have copies yet for everyone. But along with all this, you can have use this as a worksheet so you can practice each verse. Verse by verse, it has in English and in Hebrew. But along with this, we're going to have notes on the Ten Commandments and where we learn the Ten Commandments in the Shema itself. So for example, when we say, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am Hashem your God. You know what that means? That's when we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu. Hashem is our God. And when it says the second commandment, you shall not have another God before me, that's the second of the Ten Commandments, that's Hashem Echad. Hashem is one. If Hashem is one, there is none other. And so on, each of the Ten Commandments. You know, for example, you have the end of the second paragraph. It says, To the end that you and your children may endure in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to assign to them as long as there is heaven over the earth. Laman yirbu yimechem. Right? In, in Art Scroll translation, it will probably be a little bit more palatable. This was generic one in order to prolong your days and the days of your children upon the land that Hashem has sworn to your ancestors to give them like the days of the heaven on the earth you know what that's what's, what's that referring to what mitzvah is that corresponding to in the ten commandments honor your parents honor your father and mother right it, right the, 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 the emphasis here um, in order to prolong your days and the days of your children. Ah, oh, it's giving us a, it's, it's, it's referring to the commandment of honor your father and mother. She go and store and live long. And That's exactly it. It's one of the few mitzvahs that tells us the reward for observing that mitzvah. You want long life? Guaranteed? Honor your parents. True, true story. Hashem promises it. Right? We talk about, you talk, it's amazing, all of these commandments that we talk about in the, in the, in the uh, <coughs> Ten Commandments, we have right here embedded into the Shema. Question? Very good. So let's, let's begin. Okay, so we'll start, we'll start with the following. We'll start with understanding these words. Okay, Shema. What does Shema mean? Hear. To hear. Right? Pay attention. It's more than just, you know, you listen to music, but do you hear every note? Do you hear every, right? 
So when we say the word Shema, it shouldn't just be a word of, oh, Shema Yisrael, you know, it's easy. No, it should be something that, that awakens within us a pay attention, wake up. Right? It's, it's an alarming uh, call for us to internalize what we're about to say. And that is, by the way, this is a verse in the Torah. Okay, um, It is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And the following verses after that are the ones that continue in the Shema. Right, It's from verse 4 to verse 9. So we say, Shema Yisrael, hear, listen, pay attention. Yisrael, what's Yisrael? Yisrael is the Jewish people. But we have to understand that being part of the Jewish people is a responsibility. It's not just, well, this is the group. You're part, you know, you, this is, you're part of the chosen people. Right? You, we chose God and God chose us. Because God chose us and we chose God, we have certain responsibilities that we're obligated to. In this week's Parsha, one of the things that we talk about is the seven commandments, the seven Noahide laws. Right? Anybody know them by heart? Okay, so the first, we'll go through them. Hopefully I'll remember them by heart. Otherwise it's really embarrassing. Right, so... <laughs> just kidding. So we have Ever Menachai. You're not allowed to eat from from f- flesh from a living animal. Right? So in order for you to eat, if you want to eat meat, no problem. Slaughter the animal properly, and then you can eat it. Right? Now, non-Jews are not obligated to slaughter the animals like we do with, with the exact detail, but they can't just chop off a leg and throw it on the grill. That's what the Torah tells us you cannot do. Even non-Jews. Second is you're not allowed to curse God. So, um, so when s- people say something that rhymes with um, G dang it, right? Okay, <laughs> that, right. So that is something that is prohibited for someone to say because that's in a sense cursing God, right? That's a form of cursing God. Now, there are many other things that people could say that could be could, could fall into this prohibition, but that's the second. The third is theft. You're not allowed to steal. All forms of stealing. Intellectual property, in t- in stealing intelligence. In st- intelligence, I mean as follows. Um, imagine it's very, very, very hot outside extremely hot outside and you're waiting for a ride but it's like it's schmaltzing hot okay you're like you're you're right so you want to just go into a store where it's air conditioned and you're going to go inside and they're going to say sorry you a customer here get out so you do you go inside and you're like uh excuse me ma'am how how much is this and like oh that's uh two dollars like and how much is this Right? And really, you have no intentions of buying anything. You're just asking so that they don't kick you out and so that they don't, you know. So that would be a form of stealing someone's knowledge, someone's intelligence, right? Or someone's, uh, you know. And misleading. Right, right. It, it could also be misleading because <laughs> they think, they get excited, they're the shopkeeper, and, you know, they're like, oh, this person's going to buy a souvenir. <laughs> this guy's going to buy, right? And, you know, you have no intention whatsoever. You're just enjoying the air conditioning. Right, so that's another form of, of, of stealing, stealing someone's um, thoughts. You also have a very simple form of stealing is taking someone else's iPhone. Right, that's another. We we know many other examples of stealing. All of those. It's a prohibition not only for Jews but it's for non-Jews as well. These are one of the seven Noahide laws. The other is the prohibited. Uh, relations that one is prohibited to to have adultery okay so that's number four now we have courts to have a court system is a Noahide law that the, all the nations of the world are obligated to the Jews are obligated to 613 the Noahide meaning non-Jews are obligated to these seven so we just mentioned the fifth which is to have courts 
The other is not to murder. That's number five. And then we have number six is... What's that? Number five was uh, the court. Was the court. Was the court. I know. What's number six? We just said number six. Murder. Not to murder. And number seven... Was the idolatry. No, we did that already. Help me out, somebody online. Um, I don't remember what number seven is. I don't remember it off the off the off the top of my head. But if you give me a second, I can pull it up on my phone. Right, I have my notes. But uh, uh, just give me a second here. All right, I'll 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 have to get back, um, get back to everyone on this. But the the idea again, everyone is commanded. You got them? Five children? No. No. You got it? Number one, not to worship idols. Number okay. two, not to curse God. Number three, to establish courts of justice. Okay. Number four, not to commit murder. Number five, not to commit adultery or immorality. Six, not to steal, and seven, not to eat flesh nor torment. Okay, so do we say murder? Do we say murder? Yeah. We said yeah, murder. We didn't yeah. say idolatry. Yeah, we said idolatry? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, okay. okay, terrific. Oh, okay, so we got it all. Thank you. So idolatry as well, and not, not to murder. Okay, so thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, so these seven commandments are very, very clear, right? It, it, this is in this week's Torah portion, the portion of Noah, where the nations were all commanded to uh, observe the very minimum. That's so that people don't kill each other. So you have the very, very, the very minimum. We have a, a set of obligations. You know, when people ask, why the Jews? Why are we so hated? Why is there so much anti-Semitism? Why do the nations despise us? Why do they want to hurt us? There almost isn't a day where you turn on the news and there isn't some type of tragedy that happens because of a terrorist. A Palestinian terrorist just murdered two Israelis yesterday. And last week, another Israeli was murdered in cold blood. Why? What's the, what, what does the world have against us? And even when we do great things, they can't, the world can't say nice things about us. You know why? Shema Yisrael. Listen, Jews. Listen, my people. You have a different set of responsibilities. You are here to be a, 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 a symbol for the nations. You're supposed to be an example for the nations. You're held to a higher standard. It's like imagine a prince goes out into the... It goes to, uh, uh, to be among the people. So what does the king tell the prince before he goes? He says, don't forget... You're from royalty. You want to go have fun, have fun, but don't forget you're from royalty. And because you're from royalty, you're expected to act that. But I just want to be a simple guy. I want to be like everybody else. Well, you can't be like everybody else because you're from royalty. God says we're held to a different set of standards. We want to have equality with other nations. That's not in the cards. You want the, why can't we just assimilate and just be like everybody else? That's never worked in the 3,300 years the Jewish people have been a nation. We are different. Embrace it. Don't run away from it. What those Jews who are being murdered by the Germans, by the Russians, by the, all the other Baltic nations during the Holocaust, what they were saying in Shema Yisrael is we realize we're different. We realize that we are being, we're being uh, uh, devoted to what our, we're being devoted to Hashem. We're being killed for one reason, because we are Hashem's people. And we need to feel prideful of this. And that's why it's right at the beginning of the Shema. Don't beat yourself up. 
On the contrary, stand up tall and say, Shema Yisrael, I'm one of those Yisrael. I'm a chosen. I'm a chosen one. And not to run away from it. It's interesting that this commandment of Shema is a mitzvah which is obligated during the day and during the evening. We know that mitzvahs that are time-bound, women are not obligated to. It's a time-bound mitzvah. But what is the essence of this mitzvah? The essence of this mitzvah is accepting the yoke, the burden of God upon ourselves. That's not time-bound. So it's a big discussion whether or not women are obligated to recite the Shema or not. On one hand, it's a time-bound mitzvah. But on the other hand, it's not a time-bound mitzvah because they're obligated to accept that burden. They're obligated to accept that yoke, notwithstanding time. Right? Well, that's what she could say at any time during the day. Right. But, but, but that's an obligation still. It's an obligation every single man and woman and child should recite the Shema. Preferably twice a day. I tell people, I had a guy once I spoke to, he said to me, you know, I, I can't do the I can't do the the, the film thing. I said, why why not? She said, I don't have time for that. I said, you don't have time. What do you mean you don't have time? She says, yeah, I, I don't have time. I said, when do you start your day? He says, well, I start actually at 4 a.m. And he's a trainer, so he you know he says, I have clients and I go throughout the day. And he says, I, yeah, I only have. I said, you don't have a, 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 a lunch break, a breakfast break. He says, well, that's only like 40 minutes. I said, 40 minutes? How long does it take you to pray? He says, about an hour and a half. I said, what in the world is going on with you? <laughs> right? I said, you know, what, you know, it says in the Talmud, it says that the, the holy righteous, they would come an hour early to pray, to prepare themselves, and then they would pray for an hour, and then to, you know, to wind down from the prayer, they needed another hour. Imagine you did that three times a day. It's nine hours a day praying. So I said to him, what, what do you say? You know, what, what? I said to him, but when you recite the Shema, all you, at, at the very minimum, all you need to say is the Shema. Put on your film, say the Shema, and take them off. I said, that's it? I thought I have to do the whole prayer with it. I said, no. He says, oh, that's no big deal. I can do that. Right? So that's the very minimum. Right. Now, if someone says the Shema and does not wear tefillin. So the Talmud says that it's like they're giving a self, uh, uh, they, they're giving a verdict against themselves. Because what did we say in the Shema itself? We say, Ukshartam le'ot al yadecha, and you shall bind them as a sign upon your arm and let them be as tefillin between your eyes. And here you're reciting it and not even doing it. So when you when you have tefillin, you should recite the Shema. So it's not, it, you shouldn't, one should, obviously if someone's going to miss the time of reading the Shema, if they don't have tefillin for whatever reason, um, I've, I've, I've had a scenario where people, people um, left their tefillin or they were in a location where they were not able to receive tefillin until later in the day. I had a guy call me once. He said to me that he had landed in Dallas. He realized he left his tefillin at home. And he needed someone. He needed filling. He he wasn't going to have a, an opportunity to be back where he needed to be, um, or to any place before sunset. And he needed to fill in. So I called up my dear friend in in, in, in Dallas. I told him, "Listen, we got an emergency case here." And he said, "I said I have a guy. He's at the airport in DFW, and he doesn't have his tefillin, and he's not going to have a chance to put on tefillin if, if we don't get one to him. He said, no problem, I'm on my way. With three sandwiches, right? <laughs> Kosher sandwiches. And he ran, went over there and gave him his tefillin so that he could put on tefillin that day. And when one puts on tefillin, we recite the Shema as well. So it's, it's a very important thing uh, for us to understand that the mitzvahs that are embedded into the Shema as well, we have the mitzvah of, of uh, loving Hashem. We have the mitzvah of mezuzah, 
We have the mitzvah of tefillin. We have the mitzvah of teaching Torah to our children and learning for ourselves. Right? We have many, many, many mitzvahs. And we'll get through all of them. We're going to talk about them in, in, great, in great detail. So, <coughs> the next words we say. So we say, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. Listen, wake up to that message. Yisrael, be prideful that we're from the chosen people, but feel an obligation, feel a sense of obligation that this is a commandment that God placed before us. Hashem Elokeinu. So what does it mean when we say Hashem? So the words when we say Hashem should be two things. Number one is Hayah Hoveviyyeh. Hayah, Hashem was, Hashem is, and Hashem will be. You say the word Hashem, don't rush through it. Hashem, what are we saying? And so we said two things, right? Hayah, Hoveviyyeh, was, is, and will be, and Adon Kol, master of everything. Master of the universe, master of all creation, master of all beings, master of all power. That's the word Hashem. Right? You can practice thinking those thoughts. Hayah hoveviyeh. He was, he is, and he will be. You know what? God was around. You ever wonder? You ever have a struggle? Right? You have a struggle and you think, oh my goodness, how am I going to get out of this struggle? How in the world am I going to get out of this struggle? Was that your first time you struggled? <laughs> you probably had that same struggle 50 times, 100 times, 50,000 times. And every time you seem to have gotten, gotten over it. How? Haya, Hashem was there then. Hashem is here now. And Hashem will be there in the future. You know, th there's an important thing in, 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 um, in music. You have to have a constant. You have it in many other areas in life as well, but in music for sure. Right? There has to be something that's a constant. Usually it's the rhythm. The rhythm is there constantly. You can have other instruments coming in and out, but the rhythm has to be there at all times. It has to, the clicker, it has to be beating properly on time, how many beats per, mi per minute, right? Or, right? It's very, very important. Because if you don't have that beat, then you're just going to, all the notes are going to be all mixed up of, you know, the speed, the tempo is going to be all, all off. As humanity, as, as a world, as, a, as creations, we need to have a constant. That constant is the Almighty. God was, we, we're reading now about the story of Noah and the flood. Who was the God there? The same God that's now. Who was the God by the creation of Adam and Eve? The same God that's here now. And who's the God who will get us out of out of whatever troubles we have? It's the same God that took care of all those previous troubles for all those other generations. And He's the same one that will take care of all the future problems. All that is just the word Hashem. Whenever we re recite the words Hashem, we say it in the Amidah, we say it every blessing that we say, Baruch Atah Hashem. When we say the word Hashem, these are the thoughts we should have. God was, God is, God will be. And He's the master of everything. He's capable of all. The source of all blessings. Thank you, Rabbi. He's the source of everything. There is nothing that we have that doesn't come from the Almighty. Nothing. It's very interesting that this, this could, it could uh, help us understand why theft is such a terrible thing in the eyes of the Almighty. Why does someone steal? Because they want something that someone else has. Why is someone jealous? Jealousy. Because I want something that I don't have. I, I look at what the other person has. It's like, look at that red shirt. Right? I want that red shirt too. Right? So I wait till he's not looking and grab his red shirt. That's stealing. If Hashem wanted you to have that, He would have given it to you. Hashem says, you're trying to interfere with my world? You're trying to take something I didn't think was right for you, appropriate for you? 
So it's more than just that you're stealing something, taking possession of someone else. What you're doing is, is that you're sort of pushing against God's mastery of everything. That's the word Hashem. When we say the word Hashem, the name of Hashem, we're thinking God was, is, and will be, and that God is the source of all blessing. He's the master of everything. Then we have Elokeinu. What is the word Elokeinu? Our sages tell us that God is all-powerful. There is nothing. Hakol yachol. God can do anything. There's nothing that God cannot do. Uh, we can go through stories, thousands of stories in the Talmud, where people prayed for certain things. They prayed for they prayed for uh, for success. They prayed. They, who was it who went into the into the? He didn't have money for 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 uh, for, uh, for Shabbos. He didn't know what he was going to bring home for for his wife. So he went out to the fields, and a golden leg from they you know from from a from a throne, golden, came down from the heavens. Right? So what did his wife do? His wife told him, no, 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 no. That's going to eat up our world to come. Go give it back. <laughs> well, we don't have money. No, I don't want it. Right? God can do anything. Anything. You know, there's a story with one of the great Tanaic sages. Uh, his daughter was looking for oil to light the Shabbos candles. And so she went to the market and she bought oil or at least what she thought was oil. It turns out she bought vinegar. So she says to her father, what am I going to do now? I don't have time to go back to the marketplace before Shabbos to exchange this, to buy oil. So what did her father say? The same God that said that oil should burn will make it so that vinegar should burn. And so she lived. God is kol yachol. God can do anything He wants. God is the master of everything. God doesn't have limitations. We have limitations. Our, our, uh, um, our ability is limited. We can only carry this much weight. Right? We can only run that. We're limited. God doesn't have any limitations whatsoever no limitations so that's Elokeinu Hashem Elokeinu Hashem what is Hashem again Hashem was Hashem is Hashem will be Adon Akol he's the master of everything Elokeinu Hashem is all powerful there is nothing that God cannot do Right? Even when you think you're in such a, a terrible situation, it's, oh, it's, it's insurmountable. No, nothing can get me out of this. There's nothing that Hashem is limited from. Hashem is all-powerful. Now we say again, Hashem. It's the same, same uh, intention that we had earlier. And now after we say Hashem, we say three, a three-letter word. Echad. Echad. One. Hashem is one. And many have the custom to stretch out each of those three letters. Echad. Why? Well, the Aleph of Echad, right, the Aleph, is Hashem is one. The Chet, which is the numerical value of eight, is that God reigns over all seven firmaments of the heaven and earth. All right, so we have the earth and all seven firmaments. That's the eight. And then we have the Dalit. What is the Dalit? Well, just so you understand, Chet is the eighth letter of the alphabet. It's the numerical value of eight. And Dalid is number four. It's the fourth letter, and its numerical value is four. 
It's that God reigns all four corners of the earth. There are many people in reciting that, the Aleph, the Echad, right? So they, they, they also, they, they, they stop and they focus on it. But there are many people who have the custom of like sort of twirling their head, right? To all four corners, right? To like feel it. It's very interesting. Um, I was once learning with someone in our community here in Houston and... Um, it was, it was, we were learning through the writings of my grandfather on prayer. And my grandfather explains how when we pray, we have to pray with a fervor, with a seriousness, right? Almost to stand still like an angel. So this individual tells me, he says, it's so funny. He says, just this morning I was learning with a different Torah rabbi. And the other Torah rabbi was saying from the verse, that all of your bones should say, Hashem, who is like you? And our sages refer it in the Talmud to be that all of your bones should move when you pray. And when you pray, you should get involved you know, with all of your bones. He says, here on one side, you tell me, stand like an angel, stand like a... And on the other side, I hear, yo, we should be like moving around. And there are people who do this. There are people who clap in the middle of prayer. They bang and they're, they're like, they want to get their whole body immersed in. It's, it's, prayer shouldn't just be an intellectual pursuit it should be a physical engagement so that your body feels what you're saying so now we understand why some people do the the, the, the head twirl right uh, to, to the four to the four uh, sides to sort of feel that presence that God is everywhere God is everywhere there's no place that God isn't around now if you notice if you look at the at the letters of the Shema in Hebrew in the Torah and in the Siddur you'll notice that the last letter of the first word, Shema, which is Ayin, and the last letter of the last word, which is Echad, which is Dalid, they're both larger. In the Torah as well, by the way. The Ayin and the Dalid are both larger than the rest of the of the letters. And whenever the Torah gives us a larger letter, it's an emphasis for something. And whenever the Torah gives us a smaller letter, when the Torah gives us a smaller letter, it also is telling us something. Again, right? We, we know this as established already, that the Torah <laughs> doesn't tell us anything extra. The Torah doesn't leave anything out. Exactly what's there is supposed to be there for a reason. So why are these two letters larger than the rest of the text? So these two letters, the letter Ayin and the letter Dalit, together is the word Eid, which means a witness. And what we are doing in our recitation of the Shema is we are acting as witnesses to God's supreme rulership over the world. We're giving testimony to God being the King of all kings. Right? What we're saying in this Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, is we're declaring as witnesses that yes, indeed, we affirm the following statement. Similar to what someone says when they say the, the word Amen. Amen comes from the word truth. That yes, indeed. Amen. It is true what you're saying. So, that is just the first uh, uh, first words of Shema. The most uh, powerful words in, in, in all of Judaism. These are the, the words that reverberate in our soul, hopefully. And um, to, next week, God willing, we'll continue with this. And we'll talk much more about the Shema in greater detail. Um, I would like to, at the end, um, next week I will give out these these uh, these sheets. Everyone will have one, and I will also um, I would like to practice with everyone. Maybe at the end of the of the uh, each paragraph, when we finish each paragraph, we'll practice saying it in the Hebrew together. Maybe I'll get a transliteration as well. So for whoever cannot read the English, the Hebrew. Um, we'll have it in English for them. 
Uh, so that way, we don't just leave the class understanding the Shema, but actually reciting the Shema and having a, a direct <coughs> connection with its reading. So, my friends, thank you so much for joining us uh, here in, 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 at the Torch Center. And to all of our friends online, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you like, share, and comment on these videos. And you're always invited to join us live. Everything is so much nicer in person, right? Is it, is it better in person? It's a, lot better. it's a lot better in person. So with that, my friends, thank you for joining us. And we hope you join us live here at the Torch Center every day of the week, practically. We have classes. Visit torchweb.org for a full listing. Have a magnificent evening.